या सो आई थिंक जो मीटिंग स्ट्रीमिंग लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब नाउ लेट स्टार्ट रेक तूने भेजा नहीं है सबको रेडी कर दिया सर टू टू मिनट्स वर्किंग ऑन इट या 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 तो पराग आज सबको डराने वाले हो कि क्या करने वाले हो हां स्कैरी स्कैरी आज का सिंगल क्या हां बोल रहा हूं जशन डॉक्टर यूसुफ चुनावला से बात हो गई ना यस सर यस सर यस सर वेल अनाउंस इट टुडे कपिल सर डे आफ्टर टुमारो कपिल गोलवनकर सर ओके श्योर सर यस वी आर डन या सो गुड आफ्टरनून फ्रेंड्स टुडे वी आर यर वंस अगेन विथ वन मोर वेबिनार I, Dr. Virat Sangvi, Secretary, Indian Dental Association, Mumbai West Suburban Branch, along with my President, Dr. Vijay Kedar, my Treasurer, Dr. Pratibha Shetty, my CD Convener, Dr. Jashan Arora, the entire EC members of uh, IDA MWSB, and my dear friends, Dr. Kapil Golwankar and Dr. Gajanan Agarwal, along all of us, welcome you all to the webinar, a series of webinars conducted by. Indian Dental Association, Mumbai West Suburban Branch, free of cost. I welcome Dr. Gajanan today, Dr. Kapil, for having a crucial role in this uh, series of webinars. Thanks a lot, sir, to be Thanks there. Thanks a lot. You. Thank you. Thank you, Viraj, why to have us on your team. Then, sir, so it's it's pleasure to for us to have you on our team, sir. Yes, sir. Completely agreed. It's our yeah. pleasure as well. Yeah. So today. we have a speaker dr parag kelkar who is going to speak on uh, routine dental cases which can really ruin your practice it's a bit scary but definitely as as far as i know dr parag he is a humorous guy he'll take yeah, this like really lightly completely. and you know and you know, it's like hota hai sab chalta hai sab manage kar lenge he is going to be like that <laughs> uh friends there are few in a uh, few uh, announcements which needs to be made tomorrow we have dr yusuf chunawala speaking on painless dentistry ha jaise kaha gaye ho gaye sir i just want to start one thing so give me a moment yeah sure yep is it started now yeah tomorrow we have dr yusuf chunawala speaking on painless dentistry from 3:30 to 5:30 day after tomorrow uh day after tomorrow that is on 19th we have dr kapil golwankar speaking on posts and cores once again on monday we have dr yusuf chunawala who is going to speak on bad breath and its uh, management then uh, dr uh, jashan yes, sir sir yes and dharma ji sir has been uh, dharmraj sir has been confirmed yes yes, yes yes okay then after that we have dr satish ayer speaking on uh, pulp management in primary teeth and we have dr dharmraj patel after that who was going to speak on a uh, uh, pediatric rotary endodontics that is how to you how do we go on about using rotary instruments in pedo patients after that we have a really good topic by dr akshay rathi who is going to speak on clear aligners the thing which is in boom right now for all the general practitioners all the general dentists who can work with clear aligners friends request you all to please stop your audios stop your videos so that the presentation by dr parag is going to be smooth and we'll be able to hear clearly there will not be any audio lagging or video lagging the questions which need to be posted there's a chat box below please please type your questions in the chat box and we'll ask to you the people who are watching on youtube they can also type the questions in the you on the youtube channel itself we will be asking on their behalf on this zoom presentation the people the participants who have been registered in either of the webinar groups by ida mwsb that is webinars 1 webinars 2 webinars 3 webinars 4 and webinars 5 these are the five groups currently we have admitted uh joint all the participants 
request all these participants not to ask again and again to register themselves for the particular webinar this the participants who are registered on this five webinars will automatically get all the information and the link and the meeting password 15 minutes prior to the meeting yeah the new participants your friends who wants to join definitely they can message us on dr jashan arora's mobile number my mobile number and dr pratibha shetty's mobile number the youtube links the webinars are available uh, the previous webinars are available on the youtube channel ida mwsb youtube channel do go there like it join it see it enlighten yourself educate yourself with this uh, webinars these are really good webinars we had topics on endodontics we have topics on uh, uh, pain management we had topics on uh, automatic extractions we had <laughs> topics like uh, sterilization and uh, infection control during covid times we have financial lectures we had meditation lectures so you can definitely have and uh, see that do like share and subscribe to this channel to enable us work more on this aspects so i request dr jashan arora to please introduce our today's speaker so that we can start the meeting very fast yes, yes. so today we have with us dr parag kerkar he has done his bds from the prestigious nair hospital and dental college and his mds from the government dental college mumbai he is a star research scholar and has performed a live surgery at various fem famdent conferences he has lectured extensively on the topic of implantology pan india in the field of implantology since the past 15 years he has placed more than 5000 implants has a youtube channel implantologic on the topic of implantology dr parag kerkar the screen is all yours thank you first and foremost thank you thank you so much uh, uh, you all uh, members of western suburban dental association <clears throat> one of the most 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 active uh, uh, so, you know the dental branches pan india <clears throat> as you might know uh, that if it's any ida function if it's any ida award for any scientific uh, for uh, scientific programs uh, i guess there is uh, western suburban dental association beats them all uh, cape down handedly <clears throat> so uh, it's an extremely excessively active it's a superbly active branch uh, and all the members they are so active in this as you might say dr viraj was telling the list of all the presentations which are there the webinars which are there okay trust me in times like this uh, right from oral surgery uh, to periodontology to implantology prosthetics periodontics okay you have got webinars all throughout okay you have all, all throughout the week and uh, uh, you will be really 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 be uh, lucky that how much amount of knowledge okay uh, you know uh, western suburban dental association is is transferring on so uh, my again my sincere thanks for letting me uh, have this stage uh, going on to the topic now okay so little bit about ourselves this is a small operation theater which we have here in mumbai kandivli Uh, so usually we do most of our minor surgeries. Usually do we do exclusively implantology in our in our OT setup <clears throat> because what I feel is that uh, uh, you should uh, people ask you know uh, how do you sell implantology uh, and uh, uh, the diminishing prices of implantology. So the, I always uh, tell uh, uh, the doctors is that the first question you should ask is ask yourself as to why uh, the patient should pay you more. <clears throat> Uh, so number one is that uh, you should project yourself differently than any of the other of your colleagues. That's extremely one of the most important points. Secondly, implantology should be marketed, should be portrayed, and it deserves to be portrayed and to be marketed differently. So when you're placing an implant in a proper OD setup, okay, the patient also sees. He doesn't see that oh, uh, 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 dental work is doing on one chair and implant has been put on the other chair. okay nothing nothing wrong with other branches of dentistry but if you see, if you want to uh, portray okay, as an implantologist if you want to portray as a surgeon then you will definitely have to have a different market placement for that <laughs> saying so i'm not telling you that you need to compromise on your theory definitely not uh, trust me if you visit uh, my clinic you're most welcome to visit my clinic okay i usually take routinely take lectures on implantology as you might have as you known 
for everything what i see in my lectures i can i can corroborate it with at least 30 to 40 articles of uh, which i supported uh, uh, if you come to my 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 clinic i have a separate section of a library of implantology and surgery books and trust me i have read them all trust me i am a absolutely voracious reader second is your skill development right so what i have seen in the present times is that uh, usually young practitioners uh, they jump on to uh, and get glamorized very easily by 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 many short term and uh, short courses short courses what i mean to say is that you know uh, learn 10 techniques in 2 days so what my personal opinion about all these things is that uh, okay when you try to mash up many things in one or two days okay you don't get the gist of any of them a couple of years it's been almost 15 years that uh, we have been running courses on implantology and we have an entire day course only on one topic implantology on only one topic that's disimpaction sorry so entire day we talk all aspects right from surgery to complication to techniques to radiology okay on that and i still feel that it is uh, it is it is not good enough right so okay so what i'm trying to tell you is that a combination of everything number one it starts with your knowledge because knowledge opens up your mind okay your eyes only see okay what your mind knows your eyes will not be able to see things which your mind doesn't know and if you really really need to take the next step if you need to be on that level then you really need to open up your minds and there is no other way than to open up your minds by attending lectures like this but more so reading books books and books now why am i telling you this uh, is because i have attended a hell lot of uh, uh, especially implantology conferences if you see oral surgery conference they are they are actually uh, uh, knowledge based and skill based and theory based but implantology is a sold out branch uh, trust me you uh, go to any implantology conference every lecturer has been sponsored by some company so everyone is bragging about a particular product or about a particular technique just because a company sponsors it and it's extremely difficult for us to know uh, what is the marketing and what is the theory behind it so it's extremely difficult for us and that only can be clarified if you have a proper knowledge of the subject right so again a tripod thing number one is that you need to have knowledge to open up your mind second then you need to develop your skill and third you need to market it so when you have all these three triangles with you then you will be able to market yourself definitely differently as an implant lobbyist okay uh, a small thing about us okay we do run fellowship programs uh, where we have at least two or three fellows who work with us okay who assist with me in terms of general surgery in terms of oral surgery in terms of basically implantology so they'll be with us uh, placing implants see all the different types of implants or maybe the lateral window sinus lifts or ridge splits bone grafting procedures okay all those things what i feel is extremely important is the follow up it's very important uh, once you are in uh, dental colleges okay you feel that when you do the extractions okay but none of your patients uh, have any problems <clears throat> and when you start doing similar things or similar surgery or similar endodontic treatment in your private practice suddenly there is a there is a jump and a leap of of patients having complications now the fundamental thing what happens in any dental colleges is that you don't have a follow up you don't don't know what happened to your case you don't know how much amount of swelling came you don't know how much amount of infection was there you don't know how much amount of failures were there. <clears throat> so nothing wrong against any courses or anything like that but what i feel is that you need to follow up your case you need to follow up i always tell implantology is a marriage it's not a live in relationship it's not a girlfriend boyfriend relationship okay why is it a marriage because the first 6 months are uh, uh, are your honeymooning period so any implant which is placed in the mouth unless you have grossly done wrong okay will also to integrate but the real results of any implant system any implant which you have placed okay the real value of your surgery will only come after one year okay it is at that time that bone starts resorbing periodontitis starts setting in implant starts failing okay so your real test is that so what i feel always feel is that okay you need to definitely need to know the follow up and this follow up you need to know with a range of cases with a range of cases so what usually what happens is that we do a couple of cases okay and then uh, either we have a follow up we don't have a follow up but uh, uh, in our armamentarium we have not seen sufficient <clears throat> now gone are those days where people used to do uh, fellowship programs in universities 
okay or six months one year two years fellowship program so the, the recent generation is a fast generation <laughs> fast in terms of that of uh, that on everything instantly it is the generation of instant gratification so they are not uh, ready to put in time effort <laughs> okay so uh, what i feel is that what is necessary for any surgical branch or any any medical branch for that matter is a follow up okay you need to have your entire catalog of cases which you have seen done assisted and have a follow up okay okay fine this thing goes wrong okay this is has to be managed or despite doing the best of the things okay this thing can go wrong <clears throat> a simple example is that uh, people uh, in in the initially uh, in the initial part of my practice I used to go to disinfect for, for consulting. The the thing that was very common uh, was that disinfect. Uh, you know, uh, I it's a very simple thing. It's a very easy thing. But if you ask any of the oral surgeons, which are the one of the most difficult surgeries <clears throat> which they have done, they will all say it's disinfect. It's fundamentally because any <clears throat> any oral surgeon might have done maybe a thousand or two thousand or more than that case, and they know what can go wrong. now yesterday i was looking at one of the webinars of uh, uh, of one of the presenters on bone building right it was one of the present on bone building now the thing is that during the entire lecture okay what was shown that there are no complications okay there is no swelling <clears throat> there is no pain it's an easy technique okay now you ask me okay that is it what it is like is how, how far should you rely on it okay now if you're taking a part of the of the of the body of the mandible you are doing an osteotomy okay how can you say that there can never be any complications <clears throat> during the entire lecture the presenter very unfortunately never talked about the buccal artery which is over there he never talked about the facial artery which is over there he never talked about the submental artery which is over there he never talked about the buccal nerve he never talked about the lingual nerve he never talked about the mental nerve nothing nothing he didn't even talk about the bleeding which your inferior lal artery can cause if you have something goes wrong if you are doing a disinfection and if you know that you nick that you nick the inferior artery it bleeds like hell it bleeds like hell now that is one thing which most of the presenters will will just you know honey cover it honey coat it and sell sir, it to you sir extremely sorry to interrupt you uh, your presentation yeah is not to be seen you have not shared the screen okay just for one second uh it says that host has disabled attendee screen sharing <laughs> i i guess my screen share has also been so you need to disable me <laughs> try it again okay now it's it's on now okay now we are now can you see it yeah now can yes, you see yes sir it? yes sir perfect okay so that's what i was going on so uh, the very fundamental thing is that uh, nobody will tell you the complications nobody <clears throat> okay even if you go in for any implant lectures okay and any implant process okay 90% of the lectures would be on biomaterial based okay and hardly 7 to 8% will be technique based and only one or two implant will be on implant lectures will be on uh, complications now the fundamental thing about if you ask at least about 50 to 100 dentist okay the first thing what they will tell you is complication management any oral surgeon will tell you that put your hand into things which you know that you can get out of okay or else it will be a huge mess right now i'm not trying to scare you <clears throat> but i'm trying to tell you don't go for the marketing gimmicks okay for example any questions you asked okay or any technique you see the first question is okay so what are the complications associated with it okay yesterday in the day before yesterday there was one more webinar <clears throat> and we were talking about pterygoid implants <clears throat> okay it is such a glamorized branch again of implantology no but that's what i was telling them that in pterygoid implants you are connecting the oral cavity with the skull base you are connecting again i'm repeating the oral cavity with the skull base any infection of the skull base is potentially lethal so just in case if you take for example if your uh, your instruments are not autoclave okay or while placing the implant the implant falls in the oral cavity 
and you're not prudent enough to change the implant, you take the same implant and you place it as a pterygoid implant. Now you're transferring the infection from the oral cavity into the skull base. And can you imagine the repercussions of that? So what I'm trying to tell you is that there is too much more than what most of the presenters will, will tell you. It's fundamentally because they are there to sell, okay? So the presentation over here today is upfront on the face <coughs> oral surgery or and especially related to the daily dental practices. <clears throat> I'm not here to talk about how to do amyloblastoma surgeries, how to do resections. I'm not here to talk about that. So all the cases what we are going to see are everyday cases, everyday cases. And where we, including me, including me, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of places. I also missed, I've also missed big time. Okay. So uh, every, where we mess, very messed up. <clears throat> so now uh, I usually there's a joke, okay. That uh, if you ask a presenter, he, uh, how many complications have you seen? Okay. If the presenter says that, you know, I don't see any complications. So there are only two ways that it can happen. Okay, number one, he is not operative. And second, he was so stupid that he did not realize that was a complication. The more you operate, the more you see complications. But what is the difference is that, that you know how to treat those complications, you know how to take care of those complications. So it's never that you don't create complications. The rate goes down, no doubt about it. But your management of those complications increases. So today is an upfront, straightforward lecture on things which can go wrong. So what did we learn from China? The China, what we learned today is a uh, war is based on deception, right? How deceptively China made a fool out of the entire world. I was reading into most of the articles and most of the YouTube channels. And they say that this is a genetically engineered virus, which was manufactured in one of the, uh, one of the labs in Wuhan and then send it across the world. And so how, how pathetic is that? And how sad is that? But how it was completely, the, the war was based on deception. And many say, or rather even I believe that this was a third world war which China won without firing a single missile or without firing a single bullet. So in our daily dental practices also, we will have such bulbs, okay, which come to our clinics in a very sheep-like thing. Okay, I'm not talking about the people, but I'm talking about lesions. And how do we get and how do we separate these lesions from the wolf inside? And it is a, a, this is a, this is a tremendously good movie which came like Tremors. So what feels on the surface is nothing. You wouldn't even know that one of these cases will come to your daily practice. But they do come. And sometimes they come and they just massacre your practice. I, trust me, it takes years and years and years to build up the practice. One patient after the other patient after the other patient after the other but it just takes about one or two cases, okay, to just ruin your practice. I still remember one of my very good colleague dentists, okay, uh, uh, unfortunately, he did a wrong extraction, okay. Now, he is known only for the doctor who did the wrong extraction. It feels so sorry, it saddens me that out of the hundreds and thousands of successful cases he might have done, People remember only for that flaw of his, but that's our field, that's our branch. We are extremely, extremely vulnerable. Okay, so what we see in the pictures is that the real thing is what lies beneath. If you are a good diagnostician, what differentiates you from an average dentist, from an average, from an average implantologist, or from an average doctor, is your ability, your 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 technique. Okay, your 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 perseverance. Okay, to know and to find out things which are not obvious. And when they are obvious, you go ahead and get your surgical cases done and surgical strike done and nip it from the bud. So let's start the journey of all the simple cases which come to your clinic, but which can close down your clinic, which can definitely close down your clinic. Usually, uh, my presentations are full of fun and jokes, but a very unfortunate part to see, and as we travel to the travel through the through the cases, you'll see that, you know, uh, the humor, the entire thing is really gone. So let's go on and start the journey. The first case, caption, justice delayed is justice denied. So just in case if you delay in doing justice, no, that's not taken as justice. It's taken as justice denied. So let's look at a small case. A small pedo patient comes, okay? And this is one of the patients. A few of these cases have been referred to me, a few of the cases which I have seen. <coughs> one small disclaimer. <clears throat> is that these are not planned cases. So many a times there might be a slight missing link at times that photographs are concerned because as you know, 
many of these cases when the patient is alarmed they don't appreciate you taking the photograph secondly the the conditions are such that the doctor may not be in the state of mind to take photographs right so there might be a missing so my sincere apologies for that. i'll try to bridge those gap and make the presentation as continuous as possible okay so this is one of the cases child age 7 and 8 comes to the clinic she has she has a a a a, a carrier six and an e there as usual the doctor prescribes case a routine antibiotics of amoxicillin 125 mg three times a day was prescribed and uh, the doctor expected that the patient will come back with a uh, with a with a uh, with the symptoms uh, reduced but very unfortunate part was that the symptoms did not reduce in the next 24 hours the infection right from a dental alveolar abscess went into the tissue spaces and now it was a full fledged buccal space abscess now here is a huge edema which 90% of the dentists have so i like go ahead and extract the tooth or shall i do a endodontic treatment or shall i change the antibiotic or what should i do and if you are amazed i'm i've asked n number of people 80% of the patients any pd person of the doctor say that please do continue with the antibiotics till the swelling settles down secondly there's a huge misconception also that you don't extract the tooth when there is swelling unfortunately this doctor also followed the same thing and let's see what happened the swelling did stop no it did not stop now it was a pointing thing of something like a abscess drainage in the angle of the on the on the mouth so it means that the infection has traveled from the periodontal ligament into the trabecular bone into the cortical bone below the muscle into the tissue spaces into the cheek and now it has gone perforating all the muscles into the skin now does a doctor do something about it no in spite of this thing the doctor doesn't do anything about it and bam the next day it just bursts into an abscess huge again it is at this point of time okay that a consultant is referred it is at this point of time okay that the patient was seen okay very unfortunate very unfortunate because the patient is going to leave with a huge scar and as you can see i'm not much worried about the scar Okay, as much as the spread of the infection, if you see, there is a another pointing abscess just below this. It means that the abscess is just not drained completely, and it's still spreading. It's still spreading. Okay, what we do over here is that number one is that we put her on IV antibiotics. I'll give you the reason why we put on IV antibiotics. And the first thing what we check over here is whether the patient is toxic or the patient is non-toxic. Now I'll just pause over here and let's go back two days. okay let me answer the question as to when to extract the tooth so let's go back on day 1 when the patient is seen right now since this is a day 1 i give the benefit of doubt to the doctor i do give a benefit of doubt okay so now antibiotics were prescribed in the next 24 hours the patient comes with a increased swelling now there are two reasons why this can be either the bacteria are extremely virulent and second is that the antibiotic is not working So the first thing what you need to understand is is the patient toxic or non toxic means what does the patient have temperature does the patient have fever or the patient has doesn't have fever if the patient is having fever at this stage it means that the patient is toxic it means that the antibiotics are not working it means that you need to change the spectrum of antibiotics okay now any oral infection okay initially it starts with a gram positive when it goes into a tissue spaces gram negative adds to it and when it is pus forming it is because of anaerobes when you are describing a second line of treatment okay i would really really prefer something which works on gram positive as well as gram negative and also covers the anaerobes it is only after that that we will be able to control the infection so what i would have done is in this stage is that i would have given a higher antibiotic maybe a combination of gram positive gram negative maybe a third generation cephalosporin okay along with metronidazole or onidazole or tenidazole okay and i would have waited only for 24 hours right now in 24 hours i expect that this swelling would have slightly gone down but i'm not worried about the swelling i'm worried about the fever if the fever goes down it means that my antibiotics are working it means that my patient is not toxic and the first thing what you should do is extract the tooth 
Now, very in such cases, I would never go in for an endodontic treatment because, as you know, the the, the kiddo had two teeth, which could have been potentially the reason. One is an E, and other is a six. Now, E will not give a space infection. The six will give a space infection fundamentally because the roots of the six will be above my buccinator muscle, and that's the reason why this buccal space abscess. So, if it's six in this child, I will not go for endodontic treatment. because an endodontic treatment according to me will not sufficiently drain the abscess i want my patient to be non toxic for the patient to be non toxic all the toxic material in the form of tissue fluids in the form of muscle necrosis which has formed first now has to be out of the body and that my only way to do it is by either incision and drainage or by extraction now incision and drainage i would be slightly very do it in child patient especially a girl child where i have to go buccally when i have to go extra orally so i would take a chance and i would extract the tooth when you extract the tooth you have a 1 cm by 1 cm abscess drainage a uh, uh, source of drainage right and i will squeeze my pus through that how will it help is my antibiotics are acting and the factory which is responsible for manufacturing of that pus which is the tooth now it's out now the now the child now the pedo patient okay now the bachu will start uh, becoming better and better because the source of the infection is gone so my prayer to you is that don't wait till such huge abscesses develop the only thing what you need to know is a decision whether endodontic treatment or oral surgical treatment but if it's an abscess i would rather go for oral surgical treatment if the patient is non toxic so whether the patient has swelling doesn't have swelling is immaterial what is most important is either the patient is toxic or non toxic so that's extremely extremely important now well, let's go to case number 2 a case of underestimation now well, let's see what underestimation what do in our practices okay a routine patient comes and tells that there is some ulcerative lesions on the face okay as dentist you go into the mouth and you see that there is a wide ulceration the first thing what comes to your mind maybe contact dermatitis or an allergy to thing or stress and all the things similarly okay the doctor also thought the same thing okay and prescribed mucopain okay and antihistaminic okay uh, and avil avil 25 mg 3 times a day was prescribed right now let's see how the case turns up to be this is the next day can you see the lip the lip has started necrosing it started crusting it started necrosing it started the tissues have started to fall off and now if you see it has gone almost to the base of the eye if you see intraorally there is a massacre here okay you can see pus all around the teeth it means that osteomyelitis has started to take place the infection is just not limited to the ulceration out but has gone deep inside now let us understand and let us look at this case do we see a pattern over here the answer is yes we do see a pattern over here if you see the left half of the face if you see the left half of the palate it's pretty normal and distinctly it is an only the right half of the palate which is definitely seen by a triple proper line which differentiates between the affected mucosa and the non affected mucosa so now let's go back as to what went wrong was it a allergy case what is a, a was it a autoimmune case or what is it my friends this is a classic case of herpes the classic case the herpet herpes involved the infra orbital or the maxillary branch okay of the trigeminal nerve and there were massive ulcerations along the branch so on the palate what you can see is your is your greater palatine branch so all the ulcerations went along the greater palatine branch and what you can see on the face is the involvement of the infra orbital branch now this ulceration was so massive the only problem is that it was since not treated it got secondary infected and in the mouth because of the bad oral hygiene it just contributed to it one more contributing factor to it was the diabetic nature of the patient so it all went like the fuel to the flame and bam within 24 to 48 hours the patient's ulcerations increased to such an extent that it got infected and they started producing pus it was then that the patient was prescribed antiviral Okay, Vero Vir, a tablet, 500 milligrams three times a day was started. It was only after 20 to 48 hours. Now the crustaceans are slightly under control. After five days of therapy, the crustaceans start 
granulating and start healing and epithelializing. So what you see, my friend, is that underestimation. Okay, so the first time when you see the patient, it's not maybe an allergy, it may be not your contact dermatitis or maybe patient has had something as outside. But look into the pattern, look into the nature and look into the aggressiveness. Take a history, take the general history of the patient and ask yourself, is there something else which I'm missing? Is there something else which I'm not able to see? With that, let's go on to the case number third. A case of complete deception where you think something and it turns out to be something else or the lesions are so, so far intelligent uh, Dr. Parag, yeah. sorry to disturb you. Uh, there was a request from all the participants. Case wise, can you just uh, tell the name of the antibiotics which you are giving? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, in the first case, yeah, in the first case, uh, the oral medicine which we started was Zipod, Zip, uh, that's Cipodoxine. Okay, so Cipodoxine is a third generation antibiotic. So Cipodoxine and Onidazole was given. Okay, the unfortunate part is when we went uh, uh, intravenous, intravenous, then we had to give him taxim. So taxim and metronidazole was given as antibiotics. But had it been that we would have started, okay, with cifprodoxine, okay, or cifexime, 200 milligrams, cifexime clav with clavulanic acid. So that's cifprodoxime with clavulanic acid or cifexime with clavulanic acid along with oronazole. Okay, then I guess the first case would have been terribly under control. Okay, Virovir is and again a cyclovir or uh, 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 there are many brands of antiviral. So basically the, the, the brand which I prescribe is Virovir. Virovir is 500 milligram uh, three times a day for seven days. So when you give those antibiotics, okay, any antiviral herpetic infection settles down faster. Coming on to the next case is the case of deception or I said, uh, a bachu comes, right? It's a fairly normal kid. The only thing what uh, you can see is that there is a small... Uh, depression on the left side of his face, right? In the region of the chin. Okay, but a uh, patient has no pain, nothing, no complaint as such. The only thing uh, uh, what you have, again, what you see is that he's a slightly predominant chin. Okay, he has a slightly predominant chin, right? But uh, anyways, it can be any facial deformity also, or it can be just pretty normal also. It might be a class three patient. The only complaint which the child had, or the mother had rather, the child had no complaint, is that when she brushes her teeth, there is some amount of white colored discharge from his gums. That's all what it is. White colored discharge from his gums. <clears throat> he, was, he was referred to us, he was referred to me rather. And then uh, what we saw over there, the, he took the history. And the mother said that it was initially started with an ulcer. Okay. And the patient, the child used to complain that he's not able to eat over there or brush over there. And then the local dentist prescribed mucopain. Mucopain was applied over a period of time. The ulcer used to heal. Okay. No pulse discharge, nothing. And uh, life went on. Again, after two to three months, this cycle repeated. The only thing is that this time this mother was worried as to this was the fourth cycle. And this time the mucopain did not work. And that's why she was referred. So what happened was that as a routine protocol, I went ahead with the IOPA. Now, I'm really sorry about this IOPA. This, is a, this was the times when we used to have the dip dip machines, right? So now if you see the IOPA, okay, there is some amount of calcification at the apex, okay? The rule of IOPA is that if you're not able to see the extent, please go ahead with something else. So as usual, we went ahead with the OPG and bam, there it was such a massively huge lesion was lying in the patient's mandible, but no complaint of pain, no complaint of any discomfort whatsoever. The only thing which the patient's mother had a complaint that the patient sometimes has pain while brushing, which the local dentist thought it was just a traumatic ulcer and prescribed mucopain. And this went on for another four months till the time that the first started discharging from that place. Now, can you beat that? Look at the massiveness of this lesion. I did a CT scan and what we saw that the entire 90% of the lesion was lingual. And that's the reason why there is no way that there was any chance that anyone would find out that there is something on the buccal aspect. The buccal fine wall seems okay, fine. The slight bulge, what, we, what was initially, which was, which was looking, but was not very obvious because 80% of the entire lesion was lingual. We took him in the OT and we exposed it. And to our surprise, this was the massivity of the lesion. 
this was a massive it of the legion which the child was just going around in school playing going to classes nothing no complaint absolutely no complaint now if you look at the upper right side okay, there is small amount of destruction of the bone over there now unfortunately the tumorous mass had perforated the buccal cortex over there and that's the reason why it was infecting but all this while while this massive lesion was expanding there is no way that the patient understood that there is something wrong with it the patient did not even realize that it was expanding lingually there was no change in phonation there was no change in eating or drinking pattern what was done is that i had to completely completely cure it out completely now what was left was just the lingual cortical plate so what we have in this lesion is just a lingual cortical plate nothing else so can you imagine if this child would have fallen down how vulnerable he was for a fracture how vulnerable he was right it was just an accidental thing that the patient went to a went to a dentist a very unfortunate part is that maybe the dentist would have taken a iopa at least at least an iopa okay maybe things would have been something different okay now this lesion comes okay just doesn't come overnight now this has been with the patient for the last 2 to 3 years this has been expanding for the last 2 to 3 years and the patient had gone to the dentist the last 4 to 5 months a very unfortunate part is that the uh, especially with doctors who are having mass practice where they see 40 50 patients and especially children okay ulcerations we just uh, we just don't we just ignore it we just feel that you know while brushing it must have okay gone wrong or maybe a dentist is too disinfected okay but just was a passivity of the lesion and what it was it was a complex composite odontoma we separated around 49 parts of teeth okay they are not not properly teeth said so that 49 uh, teeth we would separate it out okay from the lesion but it was such a massive lesion which was just hiding below the the, the temporary teeth and the patient no the patient no the mother no the previous dentist had any idea about it so this is a extremely good case of deception how deceptive cases are there and it is extremely easy to miss in our day to day practice because in our day to day practice we are so focused on things like uh, class 1 class 2 root canals that we don't even know that this thing can can turn up that way let's go to case number 4 if anything is too good to be true usually it's not true it is absolutely right okay so you have a chubby little guy okay again a 9 year old bachu who came to us and then uh, uh his mother had a very simple problem that one of his molars was not erupting oh how such a common problem okay if you are a pediatrist 80% of your questions which which children ask as that is as is that uh, why are artists are coming okay and uh, the the answer is that yeah you know 6 months here and there they will come eventually they will come eventually so this is usually your answer okay and then you usually we tell them that okay if it doesn't come out in 6 uh, in a matter of 6 months or so then we let's do let's let's take an extra something like that okay fair enough okay now an x-ray was taken fortunately and again the same thing below the molar which was there there was some amount of radiolucency we were not able to assess properly but its extent was not known and when an opg was done bam if you see the right and the left angles of the mandible you have the soap bubble appearance what is called as the habis system is not proper over there it's a soap bubbly sort of appearance over there okay and that's the reason why the patient was sent for a ct scan to unless to 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 realize whether whatever we have done is proper or not and it was absolutely confirmed look at the size of the the jaw look at the size of the ramus of the mandible it is 3 4 times as much as a normal jaw now let's go back to the face of the patient now let's look at the okay now here is a guy who is a chubby guy every parent wants their child to be chubby okay it means that the parents or mothers are very really happy that their children are chubby it means that they are feeding really well the child is eating properly okay and that's what i say when everything is too good to be true it's mostly it's not true and very unfortunate for this guy it came out to be some lesion which was spreading in both his right and left jaw so multiple ct scans were taken so as to know now when you look at the this ct scan dr baraksh cortical sir. plate is almost yeah dr baraksh sir sorry to disturb you uh yeah. once again uh yeah. there, there were few questions regarding for, for first second and third questions 
first and second and third cases so can we finish that case questions first and then we can go ahead with the cases okay no worries let's go back huh? are you comfortable okay, sir no worries we have got 30 sure <laughs> you have got 13 cases Huh? Okay, so I guess uh, uh, there will be huge question answer session today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go back to case number one. Okay, let's go back to case number yeah. one. Yeah. Sir, there was a question that extraction after how many days of starting the antibiotics? Twenty-four hours. Twenty-four hours, right? Right. If there okay. is no fever. Doctor Ruksana, this is your question. Extraction can be done after twenty-four hours of starting the antibiotics. and doctor has answered doctor parag has answered which antibiotics to be given in this case uh, okay, so I doctor preeti yeah yeah you told you to so doctor preeti yeah. wanted to know would you prescribe proteolytic enzymes from day 1 in the case i don't prefer see i'll tell you what happens is that children have an excellent capacity of healing that's point number 1 right now your proteolytic enzymes are going to be extremely gastric irritant okay a bachu is anyways in a in a very sad state right now he is not eating parents are really worried now over that i don't want gastritis in my patient okay so i would not prefer any sarasopeptidase like enzoflam or trypsin camotrypsin i would not prescribe first line of treatment is remove the cause to remove the cause everything falls in place okay so then for the second case i suppose it was uh, can we try with endodontic treatment in non toxic patients uh in second patient second patient so i think the first patient only first patient only the first question was patient. yeah now now uh, in in this terms okay uh, the purpose you should always know what is the purpose of the treatment now the purpose of my treatment is saving the patient's life now i don't want my abscess to increase right now if you see the apical perforation the apical perforation is hardly 0.3 mm hardly 0.2 mm see this is not a endodontic case in which the infect only limited to the pulp chamber or slightly to the peri apex let us understand the infection is far more than that the infection has gone from the pulp chamber into the periodontal ligament into the havisarian system perforated the buccal cortical plate gone into the periosteum to perforated the periosteum gone to tissue spaces and is now in the tissue spaces can you imagine how aggressive this lesion is and we want it to be drained and endodontic treatment in this case will not sufficiently drain the abscess so i have my reservations regarding this because i've seen n number of cases okay the recent one which i operated was just 3 months back uh, sorry uh, 3 weeks back of an endo, uh, of, a, of a gynecologist the gynecologist had a endodontic treatment it flared up happens I'm, i'm nothing wrong with that it does happen but the only problem is that the the amount it flared up that she had almost a buccal space abscess over there okay which was like was about to burst i mean these cases uh, my perception is uh, endodontic treatment doesn't work unless unless you are also doing a incision and drainage so if you are planning a incision and drainage where you, you are allowing the pus to drain out separately then endodontic treatment might work right but i was not willing to take that chance in a bachu okay so how now in this uh, case 2 of herpes zoster right how could the clinician have clinician have differentiated between herpes and typical allergy in the first meeting itself the allergy will be bilateral if you see okay. this look at his palate it is a distinct line okay it is a distinct line so this is one of the clinic classical clinical features that it is traveling the 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 nerve so it is actually actually the infection is tracing the nerve so okay so now this is not the lesion which happens in allergy if it's an allergy it will always be bilateral if it's a allergy it will usually be be systemic right yeah, allergies don't uh, uh, secondly allergies don't cause ulcerations allergies don't cause infections allergies don't cause uh, uh, any pus discharge so these are all the cases which are now if you see the face of the patient if you see the right side and the left side of the patient okay there is nothing on the left side and everything on the right side so it's very uh, uh, it cannot be an allergy which is only unilateral anything which is only unilateral is always nerve based and it is normally it is normally herpes unilateral is normally herpes usually herpes now you yeah. have to take a bit of history of the patient okay but usually it is herpes because it is traveling yeah. along the nerve yeah 
कैन बी डॉक्टर सोमेश वॉन्ट्स टू नो कैन बी प्रिस्क्राइब काइली माइक्रॉन्स और अदर एंजाइम्स टू कंट्रोल स्वेलिंग विथ एंटीबायोटिक्स इन द फर्स्ट विजिट इट सेल्फ uh see the concept of swelling is let me tell you very simple thing is that in uh, see for example if you are placing an implant okay it's a what is called as a clean contaminated surgery because oral cavity it's contaminated but if it is a it is a, a procedure which is a, a, a which is planned procedure so that's why it's clean because you sterilize everything patient is not infected you give pre operative antibiotics right now when you prescribe anti inflammatories like uh, enzymes over there okay fair enough they will work but if you are already prescribing or, or sorry in case of an abscess where the source of the abscess is bacteria the source of the abscess is bacteria not inflammation the source of the inflammation or source of the swelling is a pus which is being generated because of the proteolytic enzymes secreted by the bacteria okay you need to control the the lytic effect of the bacterial enzymes rather than prescribing proteolytic enzymes so swelling even if you don't prescribe it doesn't matter take care of the bacteria first because they are the source of the swelling you take care of the bacteria everything else will fall in place yeah sir any steroids in herpes case i i personally don't start with steroids initially okay uh, because what happens is that for example in cases like uh, 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 Oh, like the, the patient, what you said, where it was diabetic, where it was basically immune compromised. Okay, so I preferably uh, uh, don't prefer to go on steroids initially. Okay, it's not that I, it's not a rule. It's not a rule. Okay, uh, I have given a couple of steroids just to on a topical basis to reduce the uh, the, the inflammation topically. So I might give a steroid uh, based ointment. Okay, uh, for a topical application. If the inflammation is is too much, okay, then I might give a dexamethasone 0.5 milligrams three times a day for three days, okay. So uh, if the pain and the inflammation is too much, then I might add with dexamethasone. But routinely, as a rule, I don't give. Yeah. So name of the antiviral drug in the second case with dose. Mirovir 500 milligrams three times a day, three to four times a day for seven days. Okay. And which cephalosporins are safe for pedo patients? All. All cephalos. Okay. One last question on this. One last question on the key cases. Can intraoral drainage, intraoral incision and drainage, or extraoral drainage both will be required or what? In that case. Intraoral drainage is your extraction. Intraoral drainage is your extraction. You don't require any special things. now when you are going extraorally you need to have a very sound reason why you are going extraorally but what from my uh, experience even if you extract the tooth it's an excellent intraoral drainage the only thing is it's slightly anti gravity so you need to push it press it but uh, believe me trust me there is nothing like an extraction extraction is a super way of of intraoral drainage now if you want to go extraorally in the case which i which i showed you now you really have to be very very careful because you number one that you require a general anesthesia because you'll be taking a, a a a incision on the base of the mandible okay going through your all your facial muscles and all that so extraction can be done in the clinic under local anesthesia extremely easy because whenever it's an abscess tooth it is anyways a third degree mobile tooth okay so extract the tooth expect a huge amount of bleeding at that particular point of time it's not bleeding per se it's bleeding plus inflammatory fluid plus pus okay but uh, just press everything how much ever you can and uh, you'll be surprised to see that a child starts laughing in the next 24 hours the swelling is yeah. all gone in 24 hours yeah sir dr varsha rao wants to ask you a question jashan can you just yeah. dr I, jashan I can you just ask, unmute her i'm going to charge 5 rupees for a question <laughs> varsha rao is on youtube sir i said youtube okay uh, sir dr varsha rao wanted to know if dentists are allowed to prescribe antivirals why not Like, yeah, yeah, you means with I don't know. Yeah, prescribe whatever you want, man. You are a doctor. You can prescribe whatever you want. Okay. In third case, any reconstruction was planned? Ah, no, is a bachu. Okay, so in this case, we have not planned as of now reconstruction now. Okay. Ah, uh, number one is that he's in a growing phase, right? So it's a child. It's in a growing phase. We remove the etiology. Okay. and then let the growth happen because even if you reconstruct right now he will require a secondary surgery at a later date so let the entire growth take place 
and then reintervene that area at the age of 17 or 18 and then think about reconstruction okay so let's <laughs> continue with the cases now one set has been over <laughs> <laughs> okay now so where were we we were with that okay we were this this, this bachu we didn't finish this bachu <laughs> okay so now what we had uh okay now this is what we had okay what i'll do is uh, we will finish three cases and then we'll go back again and take three three cases okay so we'll do that so that everyone that's fine sir that's fine yeah right oh okay and yeah. uh, please i only request that let, let us finish one case or as i i i lose a link of that case okay now let's go back sure, to sure. that case now if you see the medio lateral uh, cd scans of the patient you see that the buccal cortical plate is almost gone and you'll be surprised to see that this was a case of what is called as cherubism okay now usually cherubism uh, is a is a uh, autosomal dominant okay and it is a fiber osseous lesion where the bone of the patient just uh, disappears okay and forms fibrous things okay so it is not a hard cortical cancellous bone okay it is just a mushy bone with a thin buccal and the lingual cortical plate now can you beat that patient comes to your clinic with a complaint that one molar has not erupted one molar and goes back with tens of ct scans and a diagnosis of cherubism and you have to tell the patient's parent that please be very very careful because the patient can end up with a fractured mandible or a fractured maxilla okay till he's an adult now this patient is around 9 years of age diagnosed with cherubism and usually the cherubism is a self limiting means usually this bone gets converted into normal bone not a normal bone but a scar bone okay when the patient is between 21 to 25 for the next 14 years the patient cannot play cricket for the next 14 years the patient cannot play football for the next 14 years the patient's parent will be like paranoid I means if this would have been my child i would not have been sleeping at night because i don't know when is the next trauma could fracture my child's jaw bones now this is something really scary scary for the parents but uh, but it is very very good that at least it got diagnosed it got diagnosed without any trauma to the patient right without any trauma to the patient had it been that this would have been diagnosed with the child coming back with a fractured mandible okay as a oral surgeon this is very difficult to treat because how am i going to stabilize the jaw where am i going to put my plates because everything is so soft and mushy and what is the chance okay that this is not going to happen again at some other position so such children have to be really really taken care of okay so this was nothing like a, a, a like a major case that the patient came with some difficulty like uh, he is not able to chew properly or is not able to drink anything properly or a face was completely deformed or there's a fracture mandible nothing like that it's just a walk in patient comes with a missing tooth and goes out with a diagnosis of cherubism now since his facial we ask the patient parent is the is the jaw grow increasing in size so very unfortunately after 6 months we go back to the patient And so the jaws were definitely increasing size so we slightly did a recontouring we don't require to remove the lesion we just need to recontour it and as you can see on the right side we re recontour the patient and the patient's jaw is almost almost normal okay but the patient was not willing to read to go for the left side because we said that it's not worth it okay uh, uh, for the patient's parent they thought it was a, a, a small surgery but no it is not so patient was pretty happy with the with the right side we said parent it's a small child will not matter just go ahead with it just take care of the child for the next 10 15 years see if daddy doesn't have any contact sport okay so it doesn't go into any football or you know cricket or something like that so that he might hit but it was very unfortunate that a normal routine case of a daily dental practice you know comes in this way okay now case number 5 extremely unfortunate very very extreme environments once since of the cases which i have seen in my life maybe this one is the worst which i have seen okay again a small kid of i mean i really wonder god is really sometimes uh, very very partial to few people you know uh, similarly a 9 year old child comes to the clinic okay now what is the complaint again a rotated central incisor apart from that rotated central incisor patient has no complaint at all has absolute no complaint He is eating, drinking, playing. Everything is going on with the daily life, and he suddenly has a complaint of central incision. Now, what I see is that there are a couple of teeth missing also. So we went in for a OPG, and bam! This is what we see: one, two, three, four, five, six. Not one, not one, but six big 
cystic cavities his entire maxilla is hollow there's nothing in the maxilla it's just a shell and mandible only if you see 20% is a normal mandible okay rest 80% is again a shell there's nothing inside his mandible and sometimes i really wonder how is this boy going about his routine life it's so difficult and how come he has not ended up with a fracture or a dislocation or something like that it is very very unfortunate okay a ct scans were done and if you see the extent of ct scan if you see the lower lower image he the only thing which is which is keeping his mandible together is a lingual cortical plate nothing else if you see the maxilla i don't even know where the sinuses end i don't even know where the nose ends and where the cyst starts his maxilla is nothing but a hollow mushy stuff nothing else so if you see the 3d reconstructed maxilla you can see it. it's so so it's such a pathetic condition of the maxilla and the mandible so unfortunate that a 9 year old child should have this okay i can still understand one cyst at the most two come on man i cannot take six cysts in one single patient and that to a child so it was really disheartening it was really disheartening is nothing can be more unfortunate than this case it was one of the worst cases which i have seen in my entire career okay now the thing is that we couldn't uh, get the boy to undergo a massive surgery of 66 cyst secondly he has got permanent teeth also coming down so we had to be very very conservative so we took one cyst at a time and started marsupializing it trust me i have been treating this patient for the last 4 years now 4 years okay the patient's patient is really very cooperative that's why he could take it but parent parent is a uber driver so once one one cyst by one cyst by once in marsupializing changing marsupializing changing and we give them we give them a retainers you know just to see that while it is opened up no infection goes in we tried our best to do that secondly uber driver couldn't afford much of the treatment in private practice because such treatment in private practice cost nothing close to around 3 to 4 lakh rupees for 66 cysts and going to the operation theater again so this is what we did so conservative way marsupialized it and over a period of time the cyst started reducing in size bone started depositing and that's how we are treating this case so i guess it's around 4 years now okay we'll be finishing this case in another 1 1 and a half year right and most of the teeth will be in place we will require some orthodontic correction and luckily for the patient okay he followed it up okay and we were able to see to it that most of his teeth are not lost and most of his permanent teeth are are restored so very case of very unfortunate case right case number 6 a very dangerous case a case of trojan horse what do you mean by that trojan horse trojan horse means it seems very very superficial it seems very very innocuous it seems very very innocent from the outside but can cause a hell of of a lot of trauma so a case like this walks into our clinic okay gingival growth and as you can see the the condition of the teeth are horrible okay no maintenance of the teeth there is huge amount of calculus so the first thing what you realize it it must be some irritation granuloma okay maybe a gingivectomy and that will take care of it but as a routine go ahead with the iopa now as you can see the extent of the iopa not known so absolutely we go in for a opg and bam that's about it it goes almost almost about 1 cm to the base of the mandible and as you can see your mental foramen over there we go in for a ct scan it becomes all the more difficult because now you just don't have any buccal cortical plate and as you can see over here the mandible is just supported by a small piece of lingual cortical plate what is the complaint of the patient why did he come to you for well, nothing he just came in here just maybe he thought that my scaling must be done the gingival growth the doctor might just cut it off and that's about it at the end of the story what you must have thought okay fair enough oral hygiene is not so good a scaling a cure retard maybe at the most a flap surgery and that's about it but no the patient had got much 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 more to offer he had a absolutely vulnerable lingual cortical plate buccal cortical plate not known of and such is the massivity of the lesion now mind you as you go a little bit more behind the lingual cortical plate also disappears so now you just have just the 0.8 mm of the base of the mandible which is contributing to the integrity of the mandible rest nothing else nothing else the patient was taken up for a surgery it was opened up and can you imagine what you see in the oral cavity was just 5% of the lesion 
the lesion went down way, way, way below it. Once it was excised, <coughs> which happened to be a central giant cell granuloma, okay, it just left the basal bone. Rest the entire entire dentovalvulus was completely out. There's nothing over there, nothing. So can you imagine a case like this comes to our practice, who just expects that maybe just a scaling, maybe just a cure touch, a small incision, and maybe that lesion is out, and this is how it turns out to be. It turns out to be that he has left with no mandible, but just a seven millimeters of mandible, and that's the basal bone, nothing else. Okay, what worse can a patient expect? So these are an absolute case of a Trojan horse, right? Where it is so deceptive, where you don't know what actually everything is. And then everything turns out to be something, wow, major. This was a lesion. The lesion, almost about four centimeters of the lesion was excised. Well, let's go to case number seven. And after case number seven, we'll again start taking questions. No tooth is easy till it's out. This is a very interesting case for a general practitioner. Extremely interesting case. And what can go wrong? Believe me, trust me, you'll be really interested in this case. Upper left third molar needs to be extracted. Okay, absolutely in the occlusal line, visible, almost conical roots. It's an absolutely good tooth. It's not even decayed tooth. Now, what can bloody go wrong in extraction of these tooth? Okay, it's not an impacted tooth. Then nothing is wrong. Same the doctor thought. And rather than elevating the tooth, started using a forcep. Now, very rarely you might have read in the literature of the forceps is that they sometimes have a chance of acting like a, a pistol, a bullet, a pull pistol rather. And if it slips from your hand, the pressure of the forcep pushes the tooth in. And this is exactly what happened. Not only the tooth, but the entire posterior maxillary fibrosity and everything fractured and got impacted in the infratemporal fossa. This happens in a daily dental clinic because of a forcep extraction. Can you beat that? What can go wrong? A tooth which you're trying to extract slips from your forceps, fractures the tuberosity, fractures the base of the pterygoid plates, and impacts into the skull base. I don't see a simple reason, okay, why the why the why the doctor shouldn't have gone into syncope after seeing this. A very unfortunate case. Okay, this is what happened. If you see the CT scans, the entire tuberosity and entire tooth from a vertical has become completely horizontal and is now in the infratemporal fossa or the skull base which is a potentially lethal area. Why? Because you've got a maxillary artery, you've got a pterygoid plexus, you've got the, all the foramens over there, and you have an infected, fractured tuberosity and a tooth lying there. And very unfortunately, I don't have the post-op photographs of these because neither the patient was in a state, okay, this was done as general anesthesia, neither the patient was in a state of photograph nor the doctor was in a state of photograph. It was such a difficult surgery to go through the tuberosity area, locate the tooth over there, separate it from the muscles and extract it. But this all happened because of a simple, non-impacted, non-carious, non-multi-rooted tooth, just because the doctor was not slightly careful. Maybe it was a bad day. Okay, used the forcep, forcep slipped, tooth fractured, tuberosity fractured, went to the skull base. Okay, at this end, we'll slightly take questions if you if they are. If not, we'll proceed. Jashna, are there so any questions? Proceed. So we're gonna proceed ahead because there's only one. So there is one question only. What is the differential diagnosis of case five? What was case five? <laughs> <laughs> have to go back and see. <laughs> okay, case five. So that that. That kid okay, which was there. They were all dentigerous cysts. Yeah. They were all dentigerous cysts. So we planned a more conservative way of marsupializing. If they were OKC, patient, patient would have had it. Then we would have had to extremely excise everything. Okay. Okay. So the so, last the, the case was no tooth is easy until it's out. Okay. Now we so, go on to the next case. Is yeah. your past governs your future. Okay. Now let's uh, let's become a bit spiritual here. 
<laughs> okay, so what we feel that your past is your past. Okay, how will it affect your future? But in your next case, it does affect. Let's see that. Okay, now again, a patient comes to you. Slight amount of gingival growth, right? If you see the teeth, they are pretty okay. They are pretty normal. Okay, now this happens to be a young girl. Okay, twenty-four years female, and uh, uh, no other lesion as such. Okay, teeth are pretty clean. Okay. And she is just a bit worried as to you know this gingival growth is there and uh, doctor can I get it out can I remove it okay usually okay one would not even take an X-ray okay just maybe if you have a quarry or a barter pack a knife inject it and just take it out it's just a one appointment thing okay but uh, fortunately or unfortunately an X-ray was taken and an OPG was taken and what happened was shocking the patient had massive Two cysts in the jaw, one just below the gingival growth, and second is at the angle of the jaw, or the ramus of the ramus. Sorry, it's the body of the mandible. Okay, neither the patient knew had any expectation that this would happen in her jaw. Is there any complaint? No. Is there any pain? No. Is there any swelling apart from the small gingival growth? No, nothing. Absolutely nothing. This patient just walks in. And box out with the diagnosis of two massive cysts. CT scans were taken, and surprising part was the mandible. Mandible was almost thinned out. Nothing in the mandible. Nothing. If you see the three dimension, if you see that perforations in the maxilla, in the region between premolar and the molar, patient has no complaints at all. Even in the mandible, the buccal cortical plate is thinned out, almost perforated. Is there any complaint? No, absolute no complaint. When you opened it up, surprisingly, the cysts were empty. Empty. Even in the mandible, the cysts were empty. Now that gives us a diagnosis of what is called as a traumatic bone cyst. Now these are the cysts which appear empty, right? So a history was taken later on after the surgery was done as to was there any any history of trauma. The the woman remembered. Now the woman is twenty four now. That when she was eleven, she fell down from a bicycle, and she had hit the left side of the face on a rod. That was the only history. Was jaw trauma? You asked her, did you go to the doctor? She said, yeah, we just went to a doctor. The doctor prescribed some prosin or something like that, and that's about it. In three days' time, I was over. Okay, there was no bandaging done. There was no bleeding which happened. Nothing. So can you beat that? A history of trauma. 12 to 13 years back, came up with a cyst and needed a surgery. Wow, that was something really, really, really surprising which you never see in our daily dental practices. Let's go on to the next case, the case of an invisible man. Now, what is an invisible man? Okay, very surprising. This is one of the NRI patients, young chap, 31 years old. Comes only for scaling. Comes only for scaling, right? Okay, scaling is done. Teeth are fine, polished. Everything, no swelling in the buccal sulcus, no swelling in the palatal sulcus, nothing, absolutely nothing. Fortunately for the for the patient, okay, the X-ray conks off. Okay, so just to see to it whether the X-ray machine is working or not working, the patient becomes a candidate for an X-ray. An X-ray is taken of the central incisor because that's the most accessible region. The X-ray was not taken to diagnose anything. The X-ray was just taken to see to it whether the machine is working or not. And bam, you see something in there. <coughs> so that's the reason why the patient was sent in for a OPG. And OPG shows a huge lesion inside. The OPG shows a lesion which measures around four centimeters in the maxilla. A lesion shows anterior posterior extension of about 1.5 to 2 centimeters in the maxilla. Patient comes with no complaint, no swelling, no pain, nothing, and all thanks to the conked off X-ray machine that he goes with a diagnosis that he has a cyst in his maxilla. Can you imagine? A 3D reconstruction shows that there's a perforation in the palate, which the patient was completely obvious of. The patient was completely opened up. The cyst removed in total, and there was a tooth over there. It was a supernumerary tooth over there, which was the cause of this dentigerous cyst in the maxilla. That was removed. 
right? So this is the enormity of cases that, which comes to your clinic and they don't have any complaints and go back with such a major and a huge surgery. Now, enough of the serious cases. Now let's go on the lighter note. I call this lesion, the wife and the mother-in-law. Means, here is a lesion, okay, right? This is something like a central cancer granuloma. Unfortunately, if you see that the artery feeds the lesion. So I would always call the artery as a mother-in-law and the lesion, <laughs> not my wife, usually the wife. <laughs> Because usually the main source of the problem of the lesion is not the lesion per se, but the feeder. So similarly, in cases like these, okay, where the lesion is not big, okay, but the feeder makes the difference. So in such a case, how it makes a difference is that if so many patients, many times doctors ask that can this be operated under local anesthesia or general anesthesia? From the size of the lesion, yes, we can very well operate under local anesthesia, but, but, you have a feeder there. If you are not cautious enough, this thing can really, really backfire. So I would operate this case under general anesthesia. Now, when in implantology, there's a very, very big misconception that they call it inferior alveolar nerve. They never, ever associate the artery along it. Trust me, this artery bleeds a lot. Okay, so if you are in the region of seven, if you have ever nicked the inflow artery, you know how it bleeds. You definitely know how it bleeds. If you're doing a immediate extraction and an implant, and very unfortunately, if in the region of seven, and if you perforate the interradicular bone and get into this artery, this artery can bleed hell of a lot. So similarly was the case. So I opened it up and I separated the lesion from the mother-in-law and this was the artery which was separated. The artery was absolutely feeding the tumor. But I was not too sure whether it is absolutely feeding the tumor to what extent. So this artery was completely separated and the lesion was taken out. So it's not a very common lesion, okay? But if this thing happens, the question is answered, whether you do it in the local anesthesia or whether you do it in the general anesthesia. Now, the case 11 is a super case. It's called as stepping on the landmine so what do you mean by landmines okay so in vietnam war the americans had put in a hell of a lot of landmines to such an extent that they exploded even 40 years hence the vietnam war why so because they were so deceptive they couldn't see anything over and above it the vegetation the grass the trees grows around very well and that caused the deception so this was a landmine in your daily dental practice patient comes to you for scaling Okay, if you see this patient, what will you see? Scaling at the most, fair enough. Or maybe a curettage. Or at the most, a flap. What would be more than that? What would be more than a patient who doesn't complain of pain, no swelling, nothing, nothing. Okay, a one day case, just scale the patient, send him back home. Nothing else. What can be done about this case? Nothing. And what happens will really startle you. An OPG was taken accidentally. Why was OPG taken accidentally? Because the dental surgeon had planned a flap surgery. And so he wanted to know what is the level of the interdental bone. But he was zapped, amazed, okay, blown out of his bitch to see to it that there was a huge multilocular lesion from the lateral incisor to the ramus of the mandible, which was entirely eating up his mandible. So such was the enormity of the lesion. Okay. We again opened it up. They put it it turned out to be okay. See, and what you see is your your mental neurovascular bundle. So I always call this a neurovascular bundle. None of the implantologists or you if you see most of the doctors they always call it an inferior nerve. Okay, it's not a nerve only. Mind you, it's not just a nerve. It's a neurovascular bundle. Neurovascular bundle. Even if you traumatize unfortunately the nerve right there is not an immediate immediate from there is not an immediate immediate emergency but if you traumatize the artery now you have created an emergency because this artery as you can see look at the size of the artery it's around two millimeters it bleeds it does bleed on a bad day it will bleed a lot so never ever underestimate the potential of this artery even while doing your disimpaction or even while doing your your implant so, 
so next time when you look into something like this always call it as a a, a neurovascular bundle the last oh, sorry the second last case <clears throat> your negligence someone's life okay now this is a very interesting and a very scary case okay this is a case of ludwigs now you'll be amazed to see the history of this ludwigs the patient went into ludwigs after an extraction within 12 hours the previous night extraction was done very unfortunately a six was removed but but history taking was not done they had not taken the history of it and the patient went into ludwigs you might think that the case stops here the ludwigs was drained patient was put on antibiotics end of the story but no the story begins here the next day, as you can see in the x ray if you see the trachea the trachea is totally displaced laterally and if you see the ap the trachea is completely compressed now this is larynx is, is compressed now this is a very dangerous situation because the patient can asphyxiate in the next 4 hours now a disclaimer here how is it related to implants in implants if you are placing implants in the lower anterior region always 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 ask your radiologist if there are sub mental arteries over there okay are there any sub mental arteries over there are there any perforating in the mandible because because if you traumatize those arteries this is the case of your patient the only thing is that there won't be pus over here there will be hematoma over here the tongue will be raised the x ray will show similarly like this and anterior posteriorly also your larynx will be compressed in as less as 6 to 8 hours i presently know at least three cases of implants being placed and the patient succumbing to this bleeding right so please be very very careful while placing those implants in the mandibular anterior region because this will be the exact clinical symptoms now let's go back to the case this is a case what is called as cervical fasciitis fasciitis means the infection doesn't stop there it goes into the neck it spreads into the neck it eats away the entire superficial fascia the platysma of the neck and now you have the bare neuro uh, the arteries and the muscles of the deeper neck okay if you are unlucky you see the jugular here right so this is a extremely 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 dangerous case which can go wrong all because of a extracted six of a patient that you did not take history that she had diabetes so let's look at how much diabetes was it okay usually we usually rely on the patient okay the patient the doctor tells are you diabetic the patient says yes i am diabetic but under control this is what she used to say and then you rely on the patient's history and this is exactly what happened in this case okay the doctor asked are you diabetic the patient says yes doctor i am diabetic and she said yes it's under control i am taking medicines the doctor extracted the tooth all you know that the diabetes was not under control it was almost 460 and next 12 hours push the patient not only into ludwigs but a case of cervical fasciitis where the patient could have bled to death there and there because of the erosion of the jugular if the infection would have spread luckily for the patient luckily for the patient infection was under control diabetes was controlled with subsequent dressings the in the the injury got sorry the ulcer got granulated and then it healed the patient was extremely extremely lucky extremely lucky there is hardly a 5 to 8% chance of patient surviving after going into cervical fasciitis especially in such deep lesions <coughs> that comes to the last case never 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 okay underestimate never or let us understand this upper left Seven, a third degree mobile tooth. Let me underline a third degree mobile tooth. Patient was diabetic. We don't know the level of diabetes, but fortunately for the doctor, the patient was sent for two things. One was postprandial blood sugar, and second, fitness for the physician. The physician underestimated the doctor, the dentist. He says, "Yeah, you know this dentist now unnecessary. They send for fitness and all that." You know what he did? because it was a third degree mobile tooth he plucked it out with a forceps in his clinic 
a general physician plucking out tooth in his clinic in 8 hours this is what the patient is now if you see lower eyelid swelling you have seen a buccal space abscess a canine space abscess goes to the lower eyelid but mark my words if any of your cases get a upper eyelid swelling it's cavernous sinus thrombosis upper eyelid swelling now this case went into an upper eyelid swelling a cavernous sinus thrombosis 6 hours after extraction blood sugar level 465 how rash was the doctor how rash you had to take the patient under general anesthesia explore through the infratemporal space drain the abscess there get the diabetes under control and diabetics and then as you see her eyes started opening the eyelids started opening now this usually happens because of the cavernous sinus thrombosis the infection has a massively fast spread and where does it spread from it spreads from the molar through the pterygoid plexus underline my words pterygoid plexus this is the same place where you put your pterygoid implants so never 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 underestimate that pterygoid plexus that infratemporal space over there people laugh about it people place implants in the pterygoid plexus like but it can be your bad day and this can be your patient so i'm not trying to scare you but i'm trying to make you aware that heroism does not lie in overestimation of our capabilities but rightfully lies in prudently knowing your limitations so respect the body respect the procedure and know the complications and the management of complications before you put your hand into anything so first whatever whatever technique whatever procedure first ask about complications first and foremost ask about complications with this i end my small session of around 12 to 13 cases which i said which came to a clinic not because of oral surgery not because they were referred to me because i'm an oral surgeon or not because you know nothing like oral surgery cases the routine dental cases which could have gone massively wrong which could have gone massively wrong okay so my 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 parting uh, uh, advice to you is that never never underestimate any case because if any of these cases come to your prior practice and if you're not able to diagnose it or manage it okay that can ruin your practice but thank you very much thank you very much for uh, for your for your kind attention if you have any questions i'll be more than happy to answer these questions uh, thank you parak sir in fact you have opened a pandora's box uh, like it's like you know uh, how a dentist should be fearful with all the complications which are going to occur a simple case can be occurring into a vicious complication the doctors have been really now worried what to do so there are a few questions which have been asked <laughs> yes, right now uh should we advise an opg for every patient now seeing your this cases <laughs> no. No. okay first and foremost your iop iop is a must for all the cases and the simple thing is that if you are not able to appreciate the extent of anything in your iopa then opg but okay. iop is the standard of care each and every patient whether you feel it or you don't feel it before extraction please believe me i have seen so many dentists who don't go for an iopa before extraction they don't go for an iopa before extraction and trust me okay i'll i'll share with you a first uh, i was doing a consultation in ghatkopar with one a very good friend of mine and uh, it's so happened there was a radiolucency i had taken iop and there was a radiolucency on the top now whenever you are operating a radiolucency the first concept is that you aspirate and see now after you have done your pg uh, from gdc 1 cm and 2 cm lesions uh, you don't even feel anything right so you are in that air but i don't know what happened on that day the lesion was hardly about a 1 cm or so okay but, but i sticked to my protocols i aspirated and there was fresh red blood inside it so i thought maybe i might have nicked any artery so i let me do an aspiration from other direction i did an aspiration from other direction and it went out to be fresh red blood patient was sent for an angiography and it turned out to be a hemangioma can you imagine if a tooth has been extracted in an hemangioma patient would have bled to death on a dental chair okay now this can be one in 1 million cases i know that it can be one in 1 million cases but very unfortunately that one million person is you then you have had it that's the end of your career 
so friends don't be really worried about it the the motto lies in like you know proper case history taking because plenty of the things will be known from the case history and your proper uh, examination of the intraoral cavities and everything will really let you know which cases do require an extra investigations and which cases should be referred to an uh, specialist that is what dr parag kelkar tells us from his presentation today right sir yeah right i'm i'm saying that don't be i'm don't be scared what i'm trying to be cautious right don't be fearful okay secondly medical legally also you should be right okay making a complication is not legally wrong but a, a rash complication is stupidity now that accounts for medical legal uh, uh, liability yeah so uh, if the patient is under medication for diabetes since years then do right. we need to send patient for blood sugar levels yes definitely the blood sugar level should be in your hand in black and white patients uh, uh, i'll i'll tell you patients will all tell you lies it is under control okay you please go ahead i'll take the responsibility and all that i've heard all of these i've heard all of this nonsense bullshit from the patient and something goes wrong the sentence which the patient and the patient's relative tell you is aap to doctor hai na aapko pata hona chahiye na patient to kuch bhi bolega this is what i have heard consistently so never put your degree never put your life never put your experience at stake just because of the patient so let it be in black and white if it's below 200 go ahead get an extraction done get an implant done no problem about that but never ne- never rely on the patient yeah so there's one question how to avoid maxillary tuberosity fracture in third molar cases yeah extractions only, of third molars only way that you can avoid yeah if the third molar is usually if it is uh, uh, ankylosed very unfortunate your tuberosity is going to fracture on a routine case on a routine case elevate elevate and elevate until and unless you elevate it kindly don't extract the tooth okay so third molars the rule is elevation okay and only then you extend and you put your forceps in if you put your forceps in in the first shot you're bound to fracture the tuberosity okay uh sir uh, sir can we use james elevators before forcep to avoid the fractures uh which elevator sorry james james elevators oh yeah, yeah why not you can wait i i personally uh i personally use your just the straight elevator okay or if you have a periotome use a periotome nowadays i use a periotome okay but uh, i just use a straight elevator a coupland elevator i don't use uh, uh, james elevator i use a coupland elevator okay but go ahead with that if you are comfortable any elevator which you are comfortable with, go ahead with that but elevation is the rule you know that what happens is that your tuberosity is a cancellous bone so when you elevate you expand it you actually slightly distalize it right so that's the reason why the extraction becomes easier okay so a, a doctor wanted to know about a uh, steroid based ointment which is that steroid based ointment triamcinolone based ointment okay uh, you go to any medical shop or you have those uh, drug index triamcinolone okay you will have tens of uh, uh, kenacort ointment or triamcinolone ointment you get any n number of ointments triamcinolone right it's yeah. triamcinolone based ointment yeah okay so what was the cause so the cervical ascites case which you told showed what was the cause of cervical ascites due to was it due to extraction in an uncontrolled diabetic patient what happens is that when you take an incision now when the patient goes into a subcandibular abscess or a ludwig's angina you have to take a cut throat incision now when you cut the skin below your skin is your superficial fascia then comes your platysma the infection passes through the space between your platysma and your superficial fascia horizontally below your skin that's how it passes and wherever it passes it necrosis or gangrenous fasciitis it's called as gangrenous fasciitis it creates a gangrene in the neck and the entire skin above the top sloughs off because it cuts off the blood supply in the platysma and this is what happens now this uh, is fundamentally if you ask me why this happened is fundamentally started with the extraction 
was supported by diabetes and an incision in the neck was just a reason for it yeah sir uh, as regard to blood sugar there are plenty of questions like uh, at what level of blood sugar we can do extraction and yeah. at what level can we do extraction under antibiotic cover and uh, third question is uh, regarding blood sugar is if a patient is diabetic and comes to our clinic for extraction can we go for random blood sugar or we have to go for fasting and postprandial both see number one you can go for a random blood sugar <clears throat> if the if the patient is diabetic and tells that it's a properly under control educated patient okay he is very aware of what his treatment is okay a simple thing is that ask the patient ki what medicines are you taking if the medicine if the patient knows the name of the medicine it means a good educated patient okay ask him how much is your usual range good educated patient usually tell you that usually after my lunch it goes to around 160 my fasting is around 110 now you know that the patient understands all this in such patients also in such patients also just maybe a random blood sugar is good enough maybe the patient came in the morning ask him for a random blood sugar random blood sugar comes below 200 go ahead go and extraction no problem about that now your second set of patients which tell you ki no doctor i don't know what medicines are there uh, and usually i do it in once in one or two months and it is always under control now you have a patient who is not educated about the level of blood sugar and it might be faking okay he might be just taking you for a ride now in such patients always insist on hba1c okay so i don't go for uh, postprandial or a, a, a or a fasting blood sugar because many a times patients cheat on these blood sugars they do cheat so just in case if you have asked for a blood sugar level they will not have anything they will not have rice okay nothing they will have and then they get the blood sugar done naturally the blood sugar comes down but that is a wrong report so routinely in my patients i always ask for hba1c which is a average of last 3 months and you cannot cheat this blood test so if your patient has been cheating in the last 3 months okay your blood sugar uh, your hba1c will be high if your hba1c is normal it means that he is a consistent non cheating patient and you can go ahead with that as far as prescribing antibiotics is concerned extraction patients always prescribe antibiotic prophylaxis and then extract because you never 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 know see you have been not been doing this in dental colleges in nair in gdc in any of the dental colleges that they usually don't give antibiotics they extract the tooth and then give antibiotics see these patients are different they have extremely high immune system and extremely high immune response <clears throat> can you beat that when we used to do uh, disinfections in in gdc okay uh, the burrs the only way of sterilizing those burrs was putting in in spirit okay there was no autoclaving of those burrs okay so only way the patient is to survive it was in spirit did the patients have problems no they never had any buccal space abscess ludwig's fulvics nothing they had can you imagine doing that in a private practice your patient will die in next 24 hours if you do the same thing so those patients are different their immune system is different in private practice different in private practice it's always better to err on giving antibiotics and then doing it rather than becoming sorry later on Uh, friends the hb1 is hba1c values are should be below 6 uh, for a safe extraction between 6 and 7 you normally start your antibiotics and then do it pardon yes sir acha below 7 yeah yeah below 7 you are safe yeah and above 7 please please request you don't directly go and extract it bring the hb1ac levels below below 7 and then do it right sir Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that is what was asked here. What is the average level of of HB one AC permissible for extraction? <laughs> Because I knew this question would come up. Hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, so the case where the upper third molar forceps was uh, upper third molar was extracted, extracted, and it went into the space. The question is, uh, the upper third molar extraction case was the forceps slippage the only reason for the swelling and all the complication sorry i i i didn't i didn't wait your question i didn't hear. uh the, so the case the, the case where the the case where the tooth that slipped tip into the uh, space skull yeah. was was the forceps slippage the only reason for the yeah the forceps slippage was the only reason because it was absolutely a normal okay. tooth Okay, it was absolutely a normal tooth. There is nothing wrong with it. It's not like uh, it was uh, uh, there was osteomyelitis over there because of which the bone was weakened or there was an abscess over there. Nothing, absolutely nothing. If you see the X-ray, the even the uh, there is no cavitation also in the tooth. It's not a cavitated tooth also. Most probably, it must be coming in occlusion. Okay, or they might be super super erupted. That's why the tooth was extracted. Very unfortunate, but.
Okay. So, Dr. Bhavesh wanted to know about a good micro motor and a straight handpiece. Anyone? <laughs> I use a routine one. Routine hundred rupees. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. Okay, that's good enough. Now, uh, if you ask me, whatever suits you, I think so, sir. I think so. Whatever suits you and your pockets is the best one, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. See, I'm a I'm a I'm a, GD, I'm a GDC guy. Yeah. So uh, for me, uh, Moon's Probe was a tweezer uh, in two parts. That was a Moon's Probe. Okay, the straight elevator, a fracture. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, any 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 handpiece. Now, if you really want to go, you get good surgical handpieces also from uh, BDS. Okay, but they are thirty-seven thousand. Okay, now those are the ones which are non-retractable handpieces. Okay, what I recommend if you are doing disimpactions. Okay, then you have. Aerators, not the routine aerators. Let me remind you, not the routine aerators. Aerators which have a back end uh, air valve. Okay, the routine aerators. If you use, you will cause emphysema. The routine aerators, if you are using, you will cause emphysema. Again, if you are using the routine aerators for uh, maybe a socket shield technique or any implantology for splitting the tooth, and if you have raised the flap, if you have raised the flap, can cause emphysema. Right. So. Uh, Uh, if you are using that sort of uh, aerotor, good enough. Uh, I use a regular eighteen uh, hundred uh, ka straight uh, handpiece. The only the burrs I used are good Comet uh, carbide burrs. They are the ones I use. I don't use stainless steel burrs. So there is a general practitioner's dilemma after today's lecture. Yeah. So what should a general practitioner do in this special cases, sir? It's not possible to ask for an OPG for a routine patient who comes for a scaling procedure. Right. No, so go for IOP. Go for IOP. Sir, the the question seems to say that the patient has only come up to us for a routine scaling procedure. Ah. Huh. And suppose, how do we come to know that this case might be having a abnormality or something like that? See, that is what eye, the. Keep your eyes really, really open. Okay, and when you are doing the scaling, <clears throat> feel for the bone. the buccal contour of the bone the lingual contour of the bone the texture okay and i see what i always told you your eyes will only see what your mind knows okay now today after today's uh, lecture trust me after today's lecture there is one thought which has come to your mind that there is a possibility right up till now you never thought that there was a possibility from today onwards you will know that there is a possibility so what is the take away of this lecture is that next time when you go back to your clinic okay and you have a patient maybe of a scaling one thought will go through your mind ki you know why is this buccal cortex like this or why is this mucosa like this should i take a iop and you are going to take an iop and that is going to change your practice so maybe this lectures take away message is that change slightly your perspective and try to see things which your mind never knew before so the basic aim of this lecture is to open up your mind that these things do exist and it might have happened in your practice also the only thing is that they did not backfire Okay, fine. So it was a fantastic lecture, uh, Doctor Jashan. Yes, sir. Any questions from no, yours? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, where is my book? Which usually is there? It will be given to you. Definitely, it is going to be given because all the webinar, all the webinar speakers are going to be given a book. Okay. The only only thing is they will have to they will have to attend the lecture. They will attend have to attend a, a CD session or a state convention. <laughs> it's a future planning <laughs> really looking forward to it uh friends dr parak kelkar will be available today till 9 o'clock on all our webinar groups to clear your doubts sir frankly it was a real great eye opener lecture it means when things when you have a bad day what all things can happen absolutely uh friends don't need to worry about it yeah there are some bad days but due to today's lecture you will be really cautious on those bad days and the complications are going to be reduced the extent of the complication is going to be reduced if you know these things if you have certain knowledge of these things that this from here this can happen so you are ready to take care of those uh, small have occurred when you didn't have any knowledge don't worry don't worry be relaxed keep your eyes open proper case history is definitely going to serve your purpose thanks a lot dr parak kelkar for having us today with such an informative lecture friends tomorrow we have dr yusuf chunawala 
with uh, a session on painless dentistry starting at 3:30 on zoom jashan dr jashan yes sir see you have your final words and uh, end up the meeting okay thank you very much thanks a lot bye for now thank you sir thank you parag sir once again for a fantastic lecture thank you virat sir for the entire uh, helping in uh, taking the questions i was very confused as to where to start with and where to end so it was uh, good and thank you bajanan sir and kapil sir for the collaboration thank you thank you very much thanks a lot seeing you again tomorrow at 3:30 we'll be ending the meeting right now